Well, I appreciate everyone showing up tonight. Um, I'm always looking for topics. Uh, I think next month we're going to have Ron uh, Brecher, who's part of the duo with uh, Warren Keller, is going to join and talk about some of his picks insight processing. Um, I'm going to post something on the group. Hopefully, we can come up with some kind of topic that he can talk about, something you guys want to know about. Um, because basically I think he's gonna come on, give a tutorial or a demo and then mention some of the services he does. Um, Ron's been really nice over the years. Uh, he was one of the first people I reached out to when I was trying to learn how to do a mosaic. And uh, he was able to uh, put one of my first mosaics together for me. Um, and it took him a couple hours. And then I happened to be on a trip to install my equipment in New Mexico. And Gray Rupel pulled out his, his Maxim and goes zoop, 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 zoop. And he did the same thing in like five minutes. And uh, so I haven't used the Pixel Insight method that Ron taught me since, but it was just, he, he was really good back then. And since then they've written a couple books and they do monthly uh, Pixel Insight tutorials on the, uh, over Zoom or uh, Google Groups or one of those things. So anyway, uh, I guess we should start out with, uh, Bill, you want to talk about your PhD stuff? Yes. Um, I know there's a lot of topics today, so I'll, I'll try to go quickly. Let me share my screen. Okay, uh, so this has been really helpful to me. Uh, some of you know a lot more than me about how to do frequency analysis with uh, uh, different tools, but I was kind of surprised pleasantly uh, how useful the frequency analysis tool is in the PhD log viewer. So I thought I'd talk about that a little bit. So frequency analysis just really briefly is a way to convert this time-based signal as you see here, my my tracking one night into a into a frequency domain. So you're looking at at period periodic signals that are in the say. Uh, I think of it like a rock in a tire. If you got a rock in your tire and you're driving down the road, the tire rotates about once a second. You hear a click, 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 click. Well, that's that's a period of once per second. If you speed up and drive twice as fast, you're going to hear a click, 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 and you're going to hear it two times a second. So it's it's just taking this time-based signal and converting it into frequencies. Um, and what's interesting to think about is a drivetrain is more than just the worm gear. So you see the worm gear on the lower right, um, but all telescopes or most of them will have many gears. Um, the gearbox I'm showing over on the right is actually from an LX90. Um, so you can see there's at least seven gears there. An advanced VX mount has that many gears. And each of these gears has their own imperfections. It's not just the worm gear. Um, any of these other gears can have outer roundness or other errors that contribute to periodic error. This, this brass gear right here is, is a good example because there's a a set screw that's biasing or pushing this thing against the axis. So you're almost guaranteed this gear is not concentric. Uh, so in the case of the advanced VX, there's a motor shaft that spins at a certain rate and a worm gear that sp spins at a, at a certain rate after it goes through the gear train. Uh, this is kind of an animation that makes the point. You know, each of these gears is out of round, they're warped, they're decentered, there's certain gear spacing errors and gear shape errors. So if you look at the green gear, you see it's it's not rotating at a constant speed, even though it's being driven by the blue gear at a, at, on its shaft at a constant speed. And that's how I think about periodic errors in my mount is these gears um, I just have these defects that cause them to spin at irregular rates. Another thing that I learned more recently and hadn't really thought about is roller bearings also provide a source of periodic error. So there's these ball bearings in here. 
um, and they're rotating around. And if you're on an equatorial mount, you're usually load, loading a bearing. So there's more load in one direction of the bearing than another bearing. And so these, these balls kind of move past a certain point once they're loaded. And, and that can change your trekking error a little bit. Um, but more importantly, the inner race and the outer race are not necessarily concentric. Um, and it's, it's in a way like a little gear, the outer bearing, um, the outer part of the bearing is fixed. And so the balls kind of rotate over it, but on the inner race, it's rotating. So these two surfaces kind of rotate past each other and that can create periodic error as well. Going back to the Celestron AVX gearbox, I found this neat diagram um, online, but uh, you got the motor and then it's kind of walking through each of the gears and each of the teeth and their, then their, their frequency or their period of rotation. You can see there's lots of different components before you get to the worm gear. Uh, so I always think of the worm gear as the source of periodic error. It's the combination of all these things. So let's look at a trace. Um, and it's, again, here's something that looks random, but it's really not. It's, it's the accumulation of a bunch of these little frequency um, signals. So this is, yeah, the advanced VX mount. Um, and there's these signals in there, little, little um, spikes in here that are the accumulation of different periodic errors. If you go in and, and tell PhD viewer to, to look at the raw frames, and I'll show you how to do that. Um, and so these are these are not corrected for um, uh, for the worm gear or for basic tracking. Uh, you you see the the uh, amplitude of uncorrected um, activity, and so each of these cycles is probably dominated by the worm gear, but there's other things going on too. And that's what the frequency analysis tells you. If you click on the frequency analysis in the tool, it does this. And so here's, here's the worm gear if it were uncorrected, if I were not using auto guiding. Um, so there's a 594, roughly a 10 minute um, primary rotation of the worm gear. Then there's what's often called a harmonic or half the worm gear. This can occur if you're, um, if your worm gear has an engagement, so it, on one half of the gear, it's engaging one tooth of the spur gear, it switches over and engages the other tooth the next time around. So you can get different um, frequencies of that engagement effect, and those are called harmonics. And then there's the 11 second, that's the motor shaft I talked about, or, or what, what's driving um, the main gear on the spur gear, on the worm gear. Uh, and then there's other things like this 20 second, like what the heck is that, you know? So I, I do want to go back a minute for vocabulary because I see different things online. Worm gear to me is this scroll, scrolled around thingy at the top, looks like a barber's pole. The spur gear is a more traditional tooth gear. I see people online refer to them the other way around or interchangeably. I guess they're right. I always think of the worm gear as that scroll looking thing at the top. So. Um, you know, here I'm seeing my, my worm gear, a harmonic of the worm gear, something I don't know what it is, and then the output of my motor. So then when I look at the drift corrected, so this is correcting for, you know, the kind of after guiding what, what's going on, what's causing some of the spikes in the result. Get, get it a little bit different. So here's my worm gear again. There's the harmonic of the worm gear at half its period. Then uh, the motor shaft here at 11. Uh, interesting, I'm now picking up the second gear, which has a 33 second period. And uh, I, I kind of learned from searching with people online, this 20 second thing is an eight, roll, eight roller bearing that, um, that's showing up having error. And it, this, this kind of makes one of the points that got driven home with me is, in this situation, my worm gear is not my biggest problem. <laughs> it's this roller bearing. And there's nothing I can do with any of these gears and meshing and adjusting and tweaking the worm gear that's gonna have anything to do with this roller bearing. Um, but it is an interesting thing and, and it, it takes time. I had to really go through and look at these frequencies and think through 
the gear ratios to find out what they were and the fact that, that this didn't match anything. Uh, it's not related to the gears. Uh, so then on the lost Mandy mount, again, this is from Log Viewer. Um, this is a really long-term track. So this is three hours and 36 minutes of guiding. And again, raw frames, un undrift corrected at the top. I'm sorry, the red is declination. Uh, and then the blue is, is guiding. I kind of just left the declination in there for reference. Uh, but you see some pretty big swings when you're, if, this would be if I'm not using my auto guider, you see 10 arc second kind of kind of swing. So what are they? Well, the frequency plot give you an idea. In the case of my Las Monde, um, it's a 240 second worm period. And this first harmonic then is at 120. There's this 76 second thingy that I don't know what it is. It's not related to a gear. It doesn't fit any of the ratios. There's a 31 second. I call it a second harmonic. I don't think that's correct. I think there's a two to one gear. Um, or I'm sorry, a four to one gear. I think I think there's a four to one gear that um, um, is driving the worm. So it's probably that that other gear, and then some other stuff in the background. So if I look at the drift corrected, so this is again as if auto guiding was clearing up much of this. Um, really gets kind of interesting. So you see my worm gear is very well dealt with. Um, I do have this um, first harmonic. Uh, I have this. Uh, 76 thing we'll come back to. The second harmonic, again, that's a different gear in the train. I shouldn't label that as a harmonic. It is a harmonic of the worm, but it's because it's a four to one gear. And then um, the motor shaft is right there at the highest frequency. So the 76 is interesting. There's a lot of uh, um, extensive discussion and cloudy nights and other groups about Lasmandi G11 and the 76 error or the 76 blip. Uh, it turns out that's a bearing and it, it's the, it has to do with the rate at which one of the ball bearings makes a complete revolution, you know, the inner race with respect to the outer race. Um, uh, it, it comes out as an important error. And again, this drove home with me um, I shouldn't be futzing around with my worm gear. It's really good. I mean, it's well corrected. Leave it alone. Um, and, you know, I, it, really I'm dominated by this bearing and this other gear. So there's another gear in my train that's a lot more important than the worm gear. Um, so that was kind of an aha moment. And I guess uh, uh, one of the things I wanted to share is the worm gear is probably the easiest thing and the first thing people go at to adjust, but it's not necessarily your biggest problem. It could be a bearing, particularly when you load mounts heavily that might amplify this bearing effect. Um, it makes it more important because the bearing gets even more loaded. And then there could be some other gear in the train that's even more important than the worm gear and adjusting the worm gear all day long is not going to fix this 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 other gear. So uh, fortunately, procrastination paid off, and I just left everything alone because I was going to adjust my worm at some point. I realized, you know what, I'm going to leave it all alone because I'm getting good results, and uh, there's nothing I'm going to do with the worm gear that's going to fix it unless I'm willing to dig into the gearbox, and and I'm really not willing to do that. So I guess the point is. There's really many gears and bearings in a telescope drivetrain, and all of them can contribute to the periodic error. So both the gears and the bearings can have an impact. Uh, the worm gear might not be your biggest problem. For me, the worm gear was not my biggest problem with either mount. It was other gears or bearings. Uh, so adjusting the worm gear isn't going to help. Uh, and the easiest way to, to lower the the bearing issue is to reduce the weight of the payload. And, and I know there's lots online that says, well, the counterweight doesn't count. Well, the counterweight doesn't count in terms of torque on the motor, but the counterweight does matter if you're talking about the total load on a bearing. Uh, so I really try to lighten my telescopes as much as possible. I strip off any extra gear I don't need, uh, lighten the finder scope because I don't really need that so much, take off certain external baffles or covers that 
aren't really rails, anything I don't need, just lowers the, the load, not just on the gears, but also on the bearings. And before I leave this, uh, I want to show a little spreadsheet to, that helped me figure out some of this. So uh, what I did is I plugged in here one of the, you know what, I'm gonna, before I do that, I should sh actually show you this. So this is a PhD viewer. This is a trace from uh, a couple weekends ago. Um, I'm going to turn off uh, declination just to make it clear because we're only looking at right ascension. And if you right click in the latest releases of PhD log viewer, there's this analog selected frames. And it brings up this, this menu. Now, again, it's not going to do anything with declination. I'm not even sure why it shows it. But there's all this signal, including the spike and all kinds of stuff. And that's what the frequency analysis is looking at is, um, you know, what, what, what composes that information. And here it'll tell you, like right here, uh, if you look at the, the trace at the bottom, I'm looking down here um, at the status bar, that's the 242nd error um, a harmonic of that. Here's my 76 error and then some other gear in the train that's probably my biggest offender. Uh, so yeah, it's worth time uh, to look at this. The more length you have, and I would say you need at least an hour of tracking to, to get a good range, otherwise you get some uh, kind of overlap, you know, get good resolution in the frequency analysis. It's helpful. But now, but let's look at this. So I, I got these peaks and it's telling me of my overall error, uh, 45 arc seconds of that comes from the 31.9 second gear period. Okay, so uh, I want to plug that in here a minute. So I've got half. Yeah, that's there. It's a little less confusing. So I'm just going to pick four gears. Um, my worm gear, a harmonic of that, the 76 air, 39 and the motor shaft. So I'm just, I'm just picking those. I'm putting in the amplitudes that the analyzer said relate to those periods. And at the top, well, okay, so the, the bottom plot shows this graphically, uh, the frequency analysis. But you can do it the other way around. Let's say I want to create a trace, and that's what's on the top. I created a trace from these frequencies. Uh, to say, well, this is what the trace might look like given this type of periodic error. And to convince you that there, this isn't random, let's just start taking out. Um, I'm going to take out all of the errors except for the worm. So there's the worm. Yep, it's, it's a sine wave. So definitely a, a periodic. Or the other thing I can do is take out all of them but leave that first harmonic also a sine wave. So all of these these components that we think of in that frequency analysis are, are sine waves at different frequencies and they add up to create the guiding error. So uh, the point there is the guide error is not, not random. It's, it does have some random components of the wind blowing and vibrations and so on, but most of it is different sine waves from gear errors that are overlapping, or at least in my mount's case, most of that error is uh, from these gears that add up to create uh, what looks like a kind of random guide plot. It's just the overlap of sine waves at different frequencies, and and the uh, PhD viewer will will help you parse that out. Hey, Bill. So that's, that's it. Yeah. Um, how d does it does it, this analysis also tell you how much of your signal can't be accounted for by a periodic error? You know it does, but it's a bit indirect. Um, so I'm going to go back to analyzing these frames. Um, it, 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 so, you know, there's all these other things down here, right? All these other different frequencies that are not accounted for and, and probably have to do with some kinds of vibrations, um, you know, in my, in my peer or somewhere else. So, maybe the fan motor on my uh, CCD camera, right? All these things produce vibrations. So how much of it's unaccounted for? This doesn't tell you that. Um, I, maybe some of the other analyzers do. The way I say to do it indirectly is I kind of pick the five dominant peaks. And then um, I pick the five dominant peaks 
and I see what that accounts for. So 0 0.1, you know, 0.18, um, 0.3, you get the drift. If I add up all, so to speak, uh, you add it up, you get like point, I get 0.8 roughly. Well, 0.8 is, is fine, but I, I can see from here that I've got about one and a half, you know, RMS. So, you know, it's that difference is what's not accounted for. And I guess some of that stuff at the long periods, that could be like just a, a wind gust or something that happened once during your session. So it like didn't really have a, a yeah, you know, I didn't think of it, but you're right. Um, if you go out far enough, Puppy dog kind of, footsteps. I'm sorry, what? Walking on the concrete. Exactly. It could yeah. be puppy dog footsteps. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you're right. Something that occurs once in the interval, once during the night is going to have a period of, in this case, once in three hours and 36 minutes. The other thing that's kind of fun, I don't think this will show it. No, it doesn't. If you look at some of your un, undrifted brain, sometimes I had a really nice long run of like five hours of guiding, and I had this nice big arc of data, and I started to realize, you know what I'm measuring is atmospheric refraction. <laughs> um, so that was kind of interesting. But yeah, so if you do and mm -hmm. you really look out to these long periods, yeah, I'm sure that you're right. This is wind or some footsteps and stuff like that. Okay, that's that's uh, all I wanted to, to share on that. So is there uh, a long time ago, I think you had, you had mentioned to me going west heavy is, is a one, one of the good strategies to go. Um, do you think that factors into something here as far as, you know, you're not uh, swinging through a, a scenario where the gear is meshing on one side and then gear is meshing on the other side? Uh, well, hopefully what I said is be east heavy. Um, maybe it was or, Oh, sorry, east heavy. That's right. That's right. <laughs> uh, yeah. So I looked, well, I, I don't know. I'm, I, I, I looked at uh, traces where I was east heavy and west heavy. Um, and the way I did that was just I set it up to be east heavy. And then after a meridian flip, I looked at the trace before and after the meridian flip. And I really didn't see a difference. And I was surprised. I expected to see a difference. Um, I also looked at a heavy loaded mount and a lightly loaded mount. And I didn't really see a big difference there either. Now, I, that contradicts what I said earlier about bearing loading. I did see it on my AVX mount. I just didn't see it on my G11 mount. But yeah, I'm, I was a little surprised. I, I didn't look at all that many traces. I should probably look at more and and um, and see if, if it matters. Now, what people have told me, I haven't run into this, is if you're balanced almost perfectly um, in right ascension or balanced well, let's say you're not heavy east or west, then it will chatter between gear teeth and that would show up in the trace. But uh, um, I'm not that good at balancing my mount, fortunately. So, Bill, I wonder as far as the, oh, go ahead. Uh, so, so I was just thinking that's, that's a really great analysis for troubleshooting stuff. And, and I was wondering if, if you had seen in your data, is this any systematic um, effect of what declination you happen to have? So it's mostly you're tracking right ascension and, and the bearing load, does that change? You know, if you're higher up, lower down, I really find that interesting. And this tool doesn't really allow me to do that because um, I've always, I've heard people say this and I've seen this a little on my AVX mount that when I would, if I didn't pull the route line very well, I would, you know, you, you, you start to get this big RA uh, deck correction every so often. And that I could see causing my RA to, to bounce a little bit. And I've, I've I've become really curious, gosh, if would I, would I see that signal in that trace, um, if I'm not polar aligned very well, would my, um, my, would my uh, RA axis show those, you know, sort of bumps every so often where the deck correction has occurred? And I, I, I want to look at that more. I, I haven't seen that. In fact, one of the reasons I kept that declination plot on that one graph with my G11 was to show off how well I did polar alignment that night. <laughs> but, <laughs> um, yeah, I, I need to look at somewhere I didn't polar align like my ABX mount when I was portable and, and see if I see that because it should show up. I mean, I, I, I would think 
that you would see this tracking error every time the deck axis was kicking in. Well, for what it's worth, your tracking looks really, really good to me. So whatever you're doing, it's working well. Yeah, it's certainly reflected in the photos you've taken too, so. Oh, thanks. I, uh, I was wondering too on the on the race bearing kind of thing, I wonder if putting grease or something in between would keep the, the bearings from kind of tapping each other as they go around or whatever like that, but maybe that's already built into most race bearings. Um, or yeah, if you have Chinese really thick grease versus, you know, a, a, a thinner grease, you know, that sometimes people say you should do. I, you know, there's a, as you can imagine, great controversies online about what grease to use in those bearings, uh, at least on the G11 mounts. Um, and most people say not to overload it with grease because um, uh, I don't know why. For one, it corrects dust and stuff. Um, a lot of the purists will say, keep it lightly, lightly lubricated. The most important thing is keep it clean. But the other thing people do is pull the bearing out and ream, ream the, the seat open a little bit, just very little bit. I mean, just enough to pull the anodizing off the aluminum and put the bearing back in. And they claim they get better results. So their suspicion is that the, the bearings are press fit into the machined parts and that... Um, uh, that causes them to be compressed a bit. And as a result, they're more sensitive to these things rolling around and the decentration of the, of the uh, races. That's, that's the theory. Um, I, I don't know if that's true or not. What, is, is there anything that anybody's done with temperature, hot versus cold? Because, you know, that would, that would also... Yeah, you know, Steve, I find that fascinating. Um, another reason why procrastination pays is I don't see that anyone has shown there's any effect with temperature, which makes me really suspicious whether or not reaming out that aluminum makes any difference at all. I think it makes you feel good, but I don't know that it really, really did anything. I, I'm also a little bit, you know, I, these people that design the mounts, they, 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 if they're putting compression on a bearing, they probably want to. There's a reason for it, but um, to answer your question, no, I. People have talked a lot about cold weather tracking, and people have seen the motor current go up. But I don't. No one has said that they see the the bearing effect change with temperature. Oh. All right. Thanks. Thanks, Bill. I don't know. When it gets cold, the the, the thing I notice the most is that the uh, cables are. Uh, cause more problems because they're hard as a rock and they're very uh, stiff and things yes. like that. There's so many other variables that it's really hard to tell. Yes. Because I know my uh, EQ6 mount will, uh, the cables are just stiff enough that my guiding and things will look good, but I'll have drowned stars if I try to wrap them up or do things when they're really cold for some reason. Yeah, I've had a problem with that. I was, I was talking with Jack about that a while back. I, I redid my setup so I have fewer wires running. I eliminated two wires running. But the other thing I found is uh, this online, there was this uh, highly flexible cable. And I guess it's, it's uh, silicon insulation rather than PVC. And it stays really flexible um, even when it's uh, quite cold. And that that helps too, I think. Not a factor in Bill's case, but for some folks, when you're out in the in the weather, I could see where cable management might factor into seeing some cycles of that stuff too, where the cable's flapping in the breeze, and so it's got a you know two hertz oscillation or whatever <laughs> that you're not even aware of. Yeah, I bet you're right. Yeah, I used to see that a lot. The uh, people people that used to use DSLRs, they'd leave that camera strap on. And you'd be out there watching right. that thing flapping back and forth. Wow. Yeah, I've done that many times. <laughs> now, who wants to talk next? Steve, do you want to? It, it shouldn't take too, too long for me. I don't think. 
Yeah, we're in no hurry tonight. I think this is it. Yes. I like how I started this one. I like it too. <laughs> you know, when we go places and it was like 20 years ago, we'd load everything in the car, we do road trips and now we do airplane traffic, you know, and when you go on an airplane, you're limited by the amount of baggage you can take, how much you can store, big heavy things are gonna be a problem. So you can't take your cell telescope. Uh, you end up doing DSL, DSLR work. You maybe want to take some photo lenses with it, maybe some kind of tracker. You want to take a small tripod. And when you do all those kinds of things, if you can't take a good mount, you're not going to get go-tos. You're probably not going to get plate solves. You know, you're going to have to find some way of polar aligning. And a lot of times polar alignment's not as good. Uh, you want to think about doing, you know, some wide field kind of stuff. And uh, power might be a problem. You may not be able to charge your batteries. I know when my son was in England, I had a heck of a time getting from English current to the current that I could use. So one solution, if you're out on the road, is you know to use a barn door tracker. But if you can read that little bitty print, friends don't let friends use barn door trackers. I mean, they're just a pain, okay? And so, you, you know, we go and we go buy other kind of trackers. I have to has got one, a Vixen's got one, there's an Astro track, but all of them won't are, one way or the other have a problem. And so about a month ago, I found this thing. Come on, move. And, and this is reasonably new. And I don't know how good it is, but the bottom line, it's 190 bucks, okay? And ultimately it's gonna work for uh, a normal kind of tripod. And it's gonna work for DSLR and it's purely mechanical. If you look, can you see my mouse? Is, is, is this moving here? I hope it's yeah, we see it. Yeah. Okay, that turns out to be like a kitchen timer. That rotates, okay, and it rotates, it like winds up a clock. And then it starts the thing and it counts down and it'll go for about an hour. And then you stop exposures and you reset everything and you crank that thing up again and it goes for an hour. And uh, I've seen some good reviews on it. It's called, is that o Omega, whatever that is, it's called the Mini Track LX3. And uh, I'm wondering if that might be something that some people are interested in if they want to do DSLR work, okay? Uh, it weighs a little bit around two pounds uh, size-wise. Uh, that's it in centimeters. And 21 is about eight by about two by about six. So it's kind of small. It's this guy right there. It does come with the polar scope, okay? And so I don't know if anybody's seen that before but it might be something that somebody's interested in. Uh, interesting that the body here is made out of aluminum and it's not made in China. So I throw that out. Uh, I asked Dan, is that something that ASIN should consider buying for people who decide they need to go on airplane trips and they wanna be able to take some wide field stuff when they go. So I throw that one out. I don't know if you like that or not. Then in Astro League news, Last fall, Dan and I uh, are, I should say, Dan and I are both on like a list and we get uh, information from the Astronomical League. Uh, a, a, a lady who, who likes to get other people to do work uh, said that the AL program coordinators should do like a little video to describe what goes on in the programs they do. Uh, I do three programs and this month on the Astronomical League webpage, if you would look there, uh, it's mentioned that that it's dedicated to the 75th anniversary of the AL. And Bill Bogardus you know, was really important and he's just died about two years ago and radio astronomy was wonderful. So they asked me to do the first one of these kind of programs. And uh, I did it, I think it was Wednesday of last week. And ultimately, I'm not gonna talk too much about it other than to say, if you'd like to, and if you have an interest in uh, trying to learn about radio astronomy, uh, if you would like to see the video, there's the URL that'll take you to the video. Uh, it says it's 38 minutes. The whole thing is, but really I only talk for about 20 and then two other people ask some questions along the way, right at the end. Uh, and then there's a PowerPoint and that's the URL. Oh, wait a minute. That's the same. Sorry about that guys. That's the same URL. Oh, well, I'll figure it out and you'll see the right results when you look in um, the next um, newsletter. And then uh, announced on April 16th, which is just a couple of days ago, 
uh, ASI, ASI Air Pro has released a new beta. Uh, and obviously when you go to betas, you know that some things work and some things don't. And if you're interested, and, and, and I will say that I know that I've got one, I know that Stacy's got one, Mike K's got one, uh, ASIM actually has one. And ultimately, if you're interested, uh, these are the new features that you can see. There's a new plan mode, and in a plan mode, uh, it, 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 it extends the idea of you just don't do one target, you can enter information for it, turns out to be three targets, you hit the start button, and then you go to sleep, and hopefully you get a good night's sleep. Uh, it does now multi-star guiding. Uh, it does a soft restart instead of doing a full boot. But I did notice today when I tried this thing, uh, I lost my uh, Wi-Fi signal on the soft restart. Uh, apparently they got some new algorithm for plate solving and who knows if that's important or not because the thing used to be blindingly fast before. Uh, it puts a meridian line on, on the, the target kind of map and they've added some new cameras and some kind of new mounts. And it says added sequence sorting. I can't figure out how to do that. And then they optimize some stuff and your guess is as good as mine on those. Um, Steve, how does, the multi -star, how does the multi-star uh, tracking work? I, I know that there's some other, I'm gonna get rid of this. Oh, there, that's not it, so we'll go back. Um, I know I've seen multi-star working in some other places that may come out on. I've seen other places offer multi-star tracking. Uh, I, I'm, I'm guessing that it probably helps if uh, seeing is really, really, really bad. You know, when, when, when the stars look like they're jigging all over the place, maybe multi-star will help that. And that probably doesn't answer your question. And I have not been out to, uh, you know, to try this out yet, but ultimately I will try multi-star. And I'm not exactly sure you have a choice. It may be that they, I think, maybe replace just regular old tracking with multi-star tracking. Mm -hmm. That's a, what they've done, I believe, is they've installed the new version of PhD on there. And yeah. the new PhD has the multi-star tracking option. Um, maybe we can uh, get a, a demo of that in a future meeting. I know that uh, Joe, Joe, Z, Joe uh, Ziha, he's been using that and has been happy with it. Um, but I, I don't know how it works either. All right, and then there's one last slide. Uh, if you're interested in figuring out how the plan mode works, this is a tiny URL. It really does take it to a, 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 um, a tutorial that a guy put together. Um, it's, it's pretty straightforward uh, on that main screen when you can go from preview to live to auto run and all that sort of stuff. In that menu, there used to be five things. Now there are six. And the sixth thing is plan and you click on plan. And it takes you to a place where if you don't have a plan, it says you got to create one. So you create a plan and then a, a screen where it says, add your targets and like you can add three targets. And on each of the targets, you specify as many subs as you want to take. Uh, you can control your filter wheel and all those kinds of things through it there too. So apparently it, it, it's, it's something that, that, that shows promise. Shows promise in the sense that it only can do it with three things. I want more. And that's all I want to talk about. And I'm gonna on that uh, Omega Mount Mini yes. Mini Track. Yes, sir. Um, I was looking at something similar to that. There's a place called Move Shoot Move. Um, it looks kind of similar to that, and I was really. It's about the same price, and it has. Uh, I noticed it looked like it had a the one you had had a uh, a polar alignment little mini telescope there, didn't it? Yeah, it's supposed to. Yeah, um, this one had that also uh, as an option, you know, pay a little more, pay a little more. And I was really kind of thinking about pulling the trigger on it. And then I saw some reviews on it that weren't so good. So then I kind of pulled back. So that, that I find that interesting. I wonder how the two, you know, hold up against each other. Um, it sounds like this might be a little beefier. The, the move, shoot, move one looked kind of plasticky. One thing I didn't mention and I can't see it in the picture here, but let me go ahead and share this up again for just a second. That one, share. Uh, you can't see it in the picture that I that I 
have included here, but hiding back behind this ball head, uh, there are actually some, some levers that come off, and I don't know how many, six or so like that. And each lever uh, is, is kind of like a counterweight. There's no counterweight on here. And so if you have a load, light load, you know, it's gonna probably work okay. Supposedly this can work up the lenses that are like 300 millimeters. So you put a 300 millimeter lens on a DSLR, you know, that could be four or five pounds. And so there, there are levers there that create kind of like resistance that, that act like a counterweight. So I think that that's a positive kind of thing. Um, I did look, and again, I don't own one, okay? Ah, I may buy one. I did find a German review and the German reviewer thought that this was just the, the, the best thing in the whole entire world for uh, uh, doing wide field kinds of things. Uh, he had yeah, some interesting travel, pictures. Especially. Pardon? Especially for travel. Yeah, and, and, and the pictures- You get that, to some weird location, you see a really cool picture. Yeah, but you can't slap a telescope up there. Yeah, and, and again, like I said, this thing's like made maybe eight inches by 10 inches by four inches or something like that, so it's teeny tiny. But um, he's even got pictures that, are, that were taken you know, that show the entirety of uh, uh, the Veil Nebula and, and through Cygnus, and, and, it, and it's actually kind of sharp. Um, notice that they did say here, the maximum exposure of 100 divided by the focal length in minutes. Well, yeah, with a 300 millimeter lens, 100 divided by 300, that's a third of a minute, that's 20 seconds, you know, but, but I see pictures that, that people do it and they're going for like minute exposures. And they say doing the minute exposures with that, they're rejecting only like about five percent of the exposures that they have. So you know that 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 maybe is you know it, something to consider. I'll just put it that way and stop sharing. I'll be quiet. Yeah, I'm fascinated by that. That's that's interesting. Yeah, I I think I told Steve I was out with somebody, or they were they came to my observing site a few weeks ago and had one of those. Uh, kind of wind up trackers and it was really impressive worked very very well yeah and I'll point out you know like the Cadillac of the wind up trackers is it I think it's an astro track I think that's a wind up isn't it and those are like seven or eight hundred dollars or something like that and you know 191 oh and 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 there are two prices if you would go to Amazon and look one comes with the ball head one doesn't have a ball head and you would definitely want a ball head if you're going to do this kind of thing and the other truth is you also have the, okay, now it's polar aligned. Now I got to find my target in the sky. So maybe a laser would be a good thing to have on a hot shoe of a DSLR to be able to get you an idea of you know, where it's exactly kind of pointed. Uh, if your DSLR has got one of the LCD panels that pops out and twists around, you know, that would be a possibility to get you aligned where you want to go. But if your, uh, your, your LCD is permanently mounted on the back, and, you know, designed to look straight in, you know, you're going to have to crawl on your hands and knees and look up or something like that. So this whole notion of these trackers, you know, they, they, they do have some issues. But on the other hand, if you want to fly to Hawaii and take some pictures, it would work. Exactly. Yeah, I'll post something in the group. Uh... I just mainly wanted to see if anyone had any interest before we uh, go to Jim and see about uh, getting one that people can check out for the club, from the club, I should say. Um, How much are you selling the, the uh, 8300 for? Oh, we're, we're going to, the club's going to do real well on it. <laughs> there you go. Then this thing, this thing could be a part of the purchase. Yeah. Uh, oh, I need to share this, and and I, I I was I won't say I was part of the conversation, but I was there when the conversation went on, and Stacy was there, and Jim Tolman was there, and it was a talk about what's going to happen after COVID's eventually gone. What's going to happen with outreach? And there was a notion of, you know, should we keep the uh, ASI Air uh, Pro or should they sell it? You know. And so if anybody has any interest in using it and checking it out and, and that sort of stuff, you might want to share those thoughts with Stacy and, and, and JT.
I'm going to mute. Yeah, just for the newer people, the, the club has an extensive list of uh, telescopes and eyepieces and even some cameras and things. If, you, if you're a member of the club, you can check them out like a library type system, solar scopes, things like that. So uh, it's definitely one of the benefits of the club. Um, I just, I, I just always like to ask the question, you know, is someone going to use something before we acquire it? Because we do have a lot of things that have, that, that don't move at all. And things like this old, one of the old cameras that we're getting rid of, it's never ever going to be used again. It, the, the money would be better spent on uh, buying something that the, the members would use or buying telescopes to put in libraries or something, pay for outreach or whatever. So uh, if you guys have any interest in equipment that you think we should have, um, you know, post it on the group or let me know. Uh, mm -hmm. Something I thought about, and this is kind of like an information thing, but also maybe something for a future meeting. Um, right now, if you were to try to go out and say, boy, I really like planets. I want to go image planets. You're not going to do very well because, it, it, you know, it's like the planets just aren't in the nighttime sky. But if you wait till the end of August, I should say the mid to the end of August, it is technically possible to see all eight planets and Pluto, and I'll let you call Pluto a planet if you want, in one evening. And by one evening, I mean from dark to, until about midnight. And so it may be the kind of thing where we need to get together as a group out at Cromwellsick and take a look at the C-14 if anybody's interested in learning how to use the C-14 and do imaging with the C-14 and ASUM's imaging equipment that's associated with it. Yeah, for, for those that haven't used it, uh, the C-14s are one of the best scopes for this kind of stuff. It's huge, 3,900 millimeters in focal length. Uh, our camera out there actually has a Barlow on it. So we, we're getting, about 8,000, wait, what is it got on it? Um, yeah, a little over, I think it's a little over 8,000 millimeters when we plug in the camera that we have out there with the Barlow. And uh, the camera is a, a monochrome with filters. We have a whole laptop set up with software ready to go. Um, so if anyone's interested in that, if you're a member of the club, once you get trained or you have someone come out there and open, open, we can open the building anytime and you can go out and use it pretty much anytime other than like a Friday night open house type deal. And uh, you quickly find that it's much easier to go out there and spend 10 minutes setting up than it is to have to carry literally hundreds and hundreds of pounds of equipment. And uh, that's the good thing about out there. So, well, I, I'm I'm definitely interested in, in learning how to use the C14. I hadn't really thought of it about uh, specifically for planets, but you know, I, that sounds like a, a great opportunity. I, and you know, if there's a, a planet marathon <laughs> opportunity, I I guess that could be fun. It also kind of sounds like an exercise in sleep deprivation to me. But you know, I, I I'm game. You know, I I'd, I'd go for that. Um, or, or even a chance to get at one of the, the smaller, you know, the less bright planets, Uranus or Neptune, which I've really never seen. I will also point out, besides planets, that setup is good for lunar detail. Okay. Right. And so even even if, pardon the expression, right now planets aren't out, if if there'd be like a club meeting, and I haven't looked at phases of the moon or anything, but but in May, if if people are willing to get together if you've got your COVID shot and that sort of stuff. If you can meet there, and it would be good weather, if the moon's in the sky, you can learn how to do everything on the moon, and then all that will transfer right over to planets when you get to see the planets. Yeah, Steve, I, I totally with you on that. I, it's so much easier to, to learn stuff fast if the object is bright and everything <laughs> goes fast. It. Yeah, everything goes better. Uh, and I will point out in all likelihood, the Astronomical League will be having a NASA AL challenge in uh, August for those planets to be able to see all the planets in one night in order. In other words, see Mercury first, then Venus, then stomp on the Earth, then see Mars and Jupiter and so on. <laughs> Uh, 
Oh, you want me to uh, talk about Odd Nebula, or you want want to listen to to about Jack's uh, Jack's telescope and uh, the elements? Anybody? I vote for the nebula. <laughs> okay. I would say I vote for Mudman. <laughs> Oh, mine will be quick. Let's see if I can share my screen. Well, especially some of these targets you said, Dan, are sort of like time sensitive, right? Like they're good targets coming up. So, yeah, one of, let's see here. Okay, can you see my, uh, document yeah we see your desktop okay is it just showing the one screen that has the uh that's the whole desktop let me try that again yeah i just want to share my one screen here Okay, you guys can see these icons I'm highlighting, but that's all. It doesn't go any farther to the right. That's right, Dan. Okay. Correct. Yeah, one of the, I, I image more than anybody else, it seems like. So one of the issues I have this time of year is that uh, it's galaxy season. So you're mainly pointing at galaxies. They're the most prominent things in the sky right now. Um, if the moon is uh, your targets for shooting with, with narrow band filters like the HA03 or S2 filters, there's just not much there right now. Um, really about the only thing in the sky that, that's good for those is maybe like M97, the Alb Nebula is, is okay. Um, there's a few galaxies where there's HA regions that you could theoretically blend in, but th there's just not a lot to, uh, to shoot with the moon in the sky. And then if you have a short focal length scope, there is very, once you get beyond a handful of galaxies, there's just not a lot of galaxies to shoot this time of the year too. So I'm always looking for oddball things that I can shoot. And, um, I know that uh, Landon, who's, I guess, not here tonight, um, he's somewhat, I, I don't know, when he bought his equipment, I was worried that he would run out of things to shoot uh, because he has a one-shot color camera. And this time of year, he, I think he's about 500 millimeters. So there's not a lot of things that fit in that field of view. Um, but there are some off, what I call off the beaten path uh, nebula that uh, don't show up in the normal catalogs that can be fun this time of year. Um, and they're the kind of thing where you could spend a lot of time on them because they're in um, mo most of the, these in this first catalog are at high northern latitudes. And um, as you can see, this Mandel Wilson catalog, most of these are Ursa Major, Cepheus, Camelopardus, Lynx, um, so that Lyra, they're, they're things that are, that are considered in the Northern latitude cloud, so to speak. Um, this Mandel Wilson, they came up with this catalog some time ago. I couldn't find, um, there used to be a web page that went through all of this, but that web page doesn't exist anymore. So this first link, I'm, I'll post this on the group, shows a presentation on this that was given at the AIC, which is the Advanced Imaging Conference in 2005. And it talks about these, these cloud, cloud nebula. Um, these are mostly considered IFN, which is, is a term for integrated flux nebula. What that means is these are clouds of dust that are il illuminated by the stars in our galaxy. Um, these, these nebula are huge. 
Some of them will fit in you know, a five, 600 millimeter telescope. Some of these are good for shooting with a digital camera lens. Um, some of these, uh, they have different weird names, Angel Nebula, Volcano Nebula. Uh, but these would be great targets for someone, especially like landed with a really fast wide scope or someone that's got a lot of time with a somewhat fast scope that's wide under uh, dark skies like Bill or uh, even me, if I spent the time at Danville. Um, I'll show, let's see here, a couple pictures of these. This one's called the, uh, the Angel Nebula. Um, this is by a guy by the name of Bob Frankie who, uh, um, he's got a, a, a really good website. He does a lot of imaging from, uh, I believe he's in Arizona somewhere. Um, I believe he was. Stretch a, that just a little? I'm sorry. Could you stretch that out a little bit? Oh yeah. For the senior citizens. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, this is by, like I said, Bob Frankie, who um, he, he images from Arizona somewhere. Uh, this is a fairly large, large uh, nebula. Uh, all of these, this one is, is near the North Pole somewhere. I believe it's an Ursa major. Um, here's another one. I believe this is 600, uh, 600 millimeter lens. Uh, this is M81, M82, uh, but it shows all these clouds around it. And these clouds are part of the, uh, the Mandel-Wilson catalog. And this is the kind of stuff I'm talking about. And it takes a lot of time to pull out this kind of dust. Another one, MW7. This, one, this image is another by Scott Rosen, who does a lot of uh, digital camera images are real deep images. It, it looks, oops, I can't make it, it let's see here. It looks like he did some kind of star reduction or something on this, but you can see these clouds. I, I image a lot of these cloud type things. Um, and this is another one that's in that catalog. It's just important to note on these that most of these are fairly dim and uh, some of them are challenging because they're near Polaris. And uh, when you have things near, in the north, near Polaris, things like that, guiding is a real challenge if you're not really polar aligned really well. Um, guiding works really great the farther you are away from the pole, but as you get close to the pole, guiding can be a real challenge. Um, there's one of these, I don't know which one, well, it's this first one actually is centered, if you center Polaris, there's a huge nebula around it. And uh, that's one of the, the neater ones in this catalog, the image too. Um, the other catalog that I've caught a few things in is called this MBM catalog. Um, it's molecular clouds at high galactic latitudes. Uh, there's, a, there's a few papers about this. And uh, like I said, I'll post a link if you want to read about it. Um, there's also a, um, you can use a uh, Simbad, uh, which is a common thing that I use. Uh, Simbad allows you to look up targets. You, you quickly learn what Simbad is looking for as far as, and, and I edit the command line or the URL a lot of times. Like if I'm trying to identify galaxies or something like that, I'll use Simbad. You, you find the object in Simbad and then it'll show you all the other references to it. And it'll also show you, uh, show you uh, links to other things. Um, let's see here. It, it, Simbad will show you things like uh, coordinates, uh, sizes, magnitudes, shows you a picture, shows you some notes. Um, all these are different names for that same object. 
I, I know some people on the list have talked about how do you catalog your objects because you have M51, it's ARP85, it's PGC47404, it's VG, VV1, UGC whatever, you know, how do you keep track of what you've already imaged? Um, it's it's one, always one of the challenges when you start taking more and more images, but Simbad will tell you all these different things. Uh, it'll also show you any reference in scientific papers that uh, are collected. You can hit a button, it'll show you everything from 1850 to now, and you can search through those papers. It'll show you distances, like how does Dan know that this is so many light years away? Um, shows you right here, all these are papers with different distance up estimates, how it was done and the actual paper shows you references and observing logs, all kinds of things. So Simbad is a really good tool for finding information on things that you image. But you can also use Simbad to find whole catalogs. Like you can look at NGC and output, it'll put output all of the NGC numbers. Well, this is the MBM catalog that I looked up and it'll output all of this stuff. And uh, you can also use these links out of here. If you use PixInsight, one of the things in PixInsight is a uh, annotation tool. And you can easily export this stuff out of Sinbad or actually they use this advice here, but it's the same type of deal. You can export this stuff out into a file and then use it in uh, PixInsight to and notate your images. Uh, PixInsight has basic catalogs, but it doesn't have the odd stuff like dark nebula, some of the dark nebula and, and weird catalogs like this. Anyway, these uh, MBM objects, there's, I don't know, I think there's about 100, 143 of them here. Um, these are all catalogs of, of the same kind of stuff as the, the Mandel Wilson stuff considered IFN and Nebula. These are just clouds. Uh, some of these are much brighter than the first catalog. Um, these would also be really good targets to shoot at Danville or dark places. And there's a lot, these are all at what's considered high galactic latitude. So a lot of these are visible for most, if not all, of the year. Uh, what I found interesting about this one is that uh, is that uh, this catalog was made using a, uh, I believe, a radio telescope focused on a CO, C, CO at a certain gigahertz. Um, evidently, the uh, these are excited at the using that. Uh, Steve probably knows a lot more than I do about it, but these are supposedly illuminated at that transition line, uh, but they show up well in, uh, in regular light images like we take. Um, last catalogs I use, and I image a lot of these, are the Lens Bright Nebula and the Sharpless. Uh, the Lens Bright Nebula, there's 1125 of them. These were identified off of plates taken by National Geographic and, and Polymar and some of the other places. Um, some of these are cataloged on, on, on under multiple catalogs, but the, the neat thing about the Lens Bright Nebula is that you can actually look at the list and uh, it, it'll tell you the brightness of it and it'll tell you how colorful it is. And they go from uh, bright, you can see it with a, 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 a a decent exposure to being so dim that you might expose on it for hours and not see anything uh, type deal. Um, but it, it's an interesting catalog, and and I have I have it in the Excel of, Excel format if someone's interested in it. Um, the sharpless objects are really good. I, I always recommend these sharpless objects because. Um, a lot of these are considered high hydrogen alpha targets. They all should be. There's a few that aren't, and those were more or less mistakes that Stuart Sharpless did. Uh, 
found, but uh, for the most part, being that they're hydrogen alpha targets, you can image these when the moon is up using a hydrogen alpha filter. So I've been working my way through this Sharpless list for many years. And uh, these are the kind of things that you can shoot any night of the year from your driveway and color them with color filters uh, that you can take when the moon isn't up or whenever you feel comfortable taking color, normal color exposures. Um, the, uh, the Sharpless objects, um, a lot of those are also under different catalogs, but uh, let's see here. These are all the ones I've imaged over the years. But uh, like I said, the, the neat thing about these is you can uh, you can take these from your driveway uh, with the hydrogen alpha filter or the uh, I know some of you guys had the newer tri-band filters and dual band filters. And a lot of these are good targets for that kind of thing. Um, so definitely check, check out the Sharpless stuff. Um, as a side note, um, if you ever get a chance to do visual with um, like the night vision equipment, a lot of people use those night vision um, monoculars and things like that. And they'll add a hydrogen alpha filter to them. And with those kinds of things, even from the city, you can actually see a lot of these clouds. Um, and uh, they're pretty interesting. Um, I do have a link that, like I said, I'll post here. This Reiner Vogel has written a bunch of books, free, free books that he gives out on their PDFs on different classes of objects. One of his big books is on Sharpless. He has ones on the NGCs, like the Herschel. I think one of them is the Herschel 1, the Herschel 2, and something else, as well as some of the galaxy groups. So it's definitely worth taking a look at his site. Um, let me see if I have anything else here. Hey, Dan, I have a dumb question. Um, mm -hmm. The inner flux nebula, so those are in the, our galaxy. You show M81, M82 with inner flux nebula. That's the, the nebula part of that is in the Milky Way, is that right? I believe that's the way it works. It's it's dust that's out there and it's being illuminated by the stars of our galaxy is the way they explained it. I didn't go through this presentation. I, it's been a long time. I think it, ex, it goes through and explains a lot of that, how, how it's illuminated. Okay. Um, I guess I didn't I didn't get that until your presentation. For some reason, I thought it was sort of inter intergalactic, but it makes more sense. It would be interstellar. Yeah, it's mainly dust that's that's hanging out there, and the, our stars are illuminating it. I believe it's in front of those galaxies, but I'm not a hundred percent sure. Um, let's see here. This is the kind of thing that's in that MBM catalog. And on this, I can definitely tell them that the dust is in front of the galaxy because it impacts the way it looks. Let's see what else I have here. Okay, that's really all I have on that. I, uh, like I said, the Sharpless catalog, out of all those, the Sharpless is the easiest ones to image. And if you've imaged for a while, some of the, a lot of the bigger nebulous targets are Sharpless objects, but you'll find a lot of, lot more that uh, aren't as common 
that really show up well are, are still in that Sharpless uh, catalog. And there's 313 of them. And the majority, they were all found in from the Northern Hemisphere. So for the most part, everything can be imaged from here. Uh, there are a few really low ones, but uh, they're all definitely accessible from a place like Danville or somewhere with a good Southern horizon. And just real quick, uh, Ryan Jones, um, he was... Uh, Dan, can I say something before you go? Sure. Say, Ryan, uh, while you were doing that, I looked and uh, for Sinbad, if people are users of Stellarium, Stellarium can search Sinbad for an object. And so if you type into Stellarium what you're looking for, in all likelihood, it might find it. And then on the MBM catalogs, um, I did notice that uh, 60 of them are in Sky Safari Pro. Hmm. I'm done. Sounds good. Um, Ryan, Ryan Jones uh, called me, but he evidently he had to work out of town today uh, and didn't make it back. But um, I'm on one, a list of like a Slack that he's on, and um, he's been working diligently on a uh, property he bought down near, I believe it's Richwoods, Missouri, and it's supposedly fairly dark and about an hour away from Chesterfield. Um, he had been looking for some place, uh, some dark skies in Missouri to eventually possibly put an observatory. Um, so he jumped on this property when he found it. Um, and it's, it's in this, his property is in the red rectangle, a red uh, triangle, I should say. Um, you know, it's the, it, it, from this view, it's, uh, let's see here, full of trees. Uh, but uh, he's he bought it and he's been working on it. He he's committed to cleaning this area for astronomy use. And uh, this is kind of what it looks like too. It's uh, and so he uh, he ended up borrowing a tractor because he quickly found that it was going to take him several years by hand. Uh, to cut cutting down trees and things like that. And so he, this is what it looked like before. Let's see here. He has uh, made a new road in a property. He's unloaded, uh, he, I think he mentioned several hundred tons or thousand tons or some, some massive amount of rocks. He's still working on more. Um, this is the astronomy area now that he spent his vacation week uh, cleaning it. And he's working on getting some more rock. But at this point, he pretty much thinks it's ready for, for hosting like astronomy type parties. And he was, uh, he was interested in seeing if anyone was interested in uh, in possibly putting an observatory there. He's looking at building something, um, and he was trying to gauge what kind of interest somewhat some people in our group were had in possibly doing that, uh, because he's he's probably going to plan on some kind of roll off work roof observatory. Um, there are a few challenges. Um, power is a third of a mile away, so it's it will be uh, probably off the grid solar. Um, he he has experience in this, so that's that's not really an issue. Um, as far as internet goes, he has some kind of wireless internet through a local company. Uh, he says four and five G also work down there. Um, but uh, he's more or less 
trying to gauge interest to determine how big a building he's going to uh, build down there. So uh, if anyone has any interest, uh, let me know, because um, he's going to put together some kind of Zoom type meeting or something like that and talk about it fairly soon, because I think he's ready to uh, get started. He just doesn't know if he's building a building for two piers or eight piers or what he's building down there. Um, again, this place is, uh, he claims it's, he claims it's very dark, uh, possibly darker than Danville. And uh, it's off of 47 going south uh, to near Richwoods. Um, so he claims it's, it's about an hour away from Chesterfield. So depending on where you're at, it's closer to Danville or just slightly farther away. Uh, he does have some kind of trailer uh, RV on site and they do have power there and, and things like that. Um, so I expect him to probably post something fairly soon and try to do some kind of star party down there regardless. But uh, if you have any interest, uh, let me know and I'll get it to him and uh, he'll reach out. Okay, Jack, you want to fill us in on your uh, your? Sure. <laughs> I don't even know how to explain it. Experience. Yeah. <laughs> uh, let me see if I can do the share. Hopefully, this will. Sorry. Okay, do you see, you probably see the wrong thing, let me. Yeah, we're not seeing anything yet, just your picture. Oh, okay, hang on. I'll, I'll say that the guy who manages Jack's uh, observing site did not invest in uh, several tons of gravel. I just have to <laughs> the right screen here, hang on just a second. Okay, so you either see- uh, We've PowerPoint. got the, the, uh, the PowerPoint up. Okay, but do you see the PowerPoint app or do you see just a screen, a, a slide? Uh, I see the full PowerPoint with the, with the, uh, the stuff on the left side too. Uh, yeah. It's not the slideshow. Okay, let me, let me stop share and let me try to start share and see if I can tell it the right screen this time. No, not that. Oh, that looked like that might have been the right one. How, how does that look? Yeah, that's okay. the full slide. Okay. All right. So today we're going to talk about the adverse effects of mud on a Newtonian telescope and DSLR and the associated cleanup. That's by your humble narrator. I'm an astronomer and a failed off-roader. So uh, let's say mistakes were made. So I was out there oh. Oh observing at uh, a uh, wonderful location, nice dark skies. And uh, one of the things that I've observed there many, many, many times, and one of the things I was aware of was there's some soggy spots and there's some not so soggy spots. And so I parked my car in the not so soggy spot and I started observing and then I go, you know, I think I'm gonna move my car. So I pulled my car into the soggy spot and everything was fine, by the way. I, by the way, I was observing, so the the uh, telescope, you know, lens cap was off. The, uh, you know, the camera was hot. Everything was, you know, I was tracking, got my alignment, everything's good. And I said, yeah, I'm going to move the car. So I move the car and then uh, get into the soggy spot. So far, I'm still okay. Uh, I back up the car and I'm spinning my wheels. Uh, Yep, I'm still okay because the mud's going the opposite way, so everything's good, but I didn't know that. 
then somebody helped me out a little bit. They pushed and I, okay, good. Now I'm going to go ahead and pull forward. So I get my car completely out of the way. That's when I did this. And, uh, I, I flung a lot of mud. So mistakes were made. <laughs> So, uh, and the, the camera got it pretty good. Um, that's a D850. Um, the good news there is you can see, I don't know if you can see, but on the side, it has the little cable covers. Every single one of those cable covers was closed. And so that really saved my bacon, I think, to a great extent. Um, but, uh, yeah, and then there's there's the uh, coma corrector sitting there. It was pretty much unscathed, uh, except for the the T ring got a little bit of mud on it. So. Wait, so, Jack, is, first thing is I this wanted... story is this story going to have a happy ending? Because otherwise, I'd feel real bad <laughs> laughing at this. This is hard to look at. <laughs> oh, and I, I'm sorry. I wanted to preface this with first of all, a I am very thick skinned. Uh, part of my job is to to uh, get people mad at me almost. Uh, um, pretty much a paper pusher at, at a uh, financial company. And so I'm pretty thick skinned, um, uh, but also uh, there is a, a happy ending to this. So, um, and this is actually the first uh, of, of many triumphs. Uh, when I cleaned up the Nikon, uh, as you can see, it doesn't look anything like what the other one did, but um, the, uh, one of the first things I did was put a regular Joe lens on this and take a picture and it, and it took. So I was like, okay, well, I'm, I'm a big chunk of my money is back already. Otherwise I thought I had an overpriced, you know, uh, boat anchor. Um, but uh, I was uh, also in the, in the back back of my mind, I'm going, Hmm, time for a telescope upgrade. But anyway, I digress. So I got the, the camera cleaned up pretty quickly. Uh, I just used uh, distilled water, Q-tips. Um, I just kind of picked at some of the mud that was just loose. Uh, it's kind of surprising. It was like a, you know, uh, a mud bath kind of uh, therapeutic thing. So some of it just picked right off. Uh, and also I got a little bit of mud on the, the bottom of the telescope. I think that was actually after everything was over when I was setting things down and that. But, so, so um, uh, Jack, I, Jack, question. Yes. Uh, how many hours mm -hmm. of how many hours was it picking mud off of the camera? Uh, the camera, I would say, I did in two evenings, probably an uh, hour and a half each. Okay. Surprisingly. I, 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 yeah, I just want to know how how much to budget, you know, time for when this happens to me someday. Right. Right. Uh, yes, I would. Uh, well, I'll, I'll talk to uh, lessons learned at the later slide. Um, <laughs> and one of the things I did as I was starting right out of the shoot, um, I've taken apart a laptop before. And so um, I would say this is easier than taking apart a laptop. laptop. Um, but I, I put, you know, screws and nuts and ba bolts into baggies and put little post-it notes in there to say, this came off of this, this came off of that, and, you know, all that kind of jazz. No parts were, were lost, although I did find out that I was missing a part to begin with on one thing, so that was kind of interesting. So I, uh, one of the first things I took out was the primary mirror because I was afraid I would drop something on it. Um, you know, I'm, uh, I wasn't too terribly clever in that I worked on it in an upright position. So, um, you know, a big old chunk of mud or a rock or, or uh, you know, the actual mount itself might drop, or uh, sorry, a screw or something like that might drop on it. So one of the first things I took out was the primary mirror and the, and the mount it was on. And you can see that some mud had gotten back in there. Um, there's some dust there. Um, so it's possible that a lot of that dust came after the accident um, because as I'm cleaning off the mud, it was kind of, you know, flying in the air and, and all this. A lot of this was done in the garage, so, um, but I wasn't too worried about that. It looked like it was in halfway decent shape. So the, uh, I started on the teardown, uh, took out the focuser. Um, you can see off to the right of the focuser is the, uh, the uh, spotting scope mount. 
Um, and uh, up at the top is is the the ring for holding in uh, just just protecting you from cutting yourself on the on the uh, metal tube as well as holding some things in place. There's the finder scope back plate. So if I had taken that apart and not really paid attention to it, everything, uh, that would have definitely dropped down on the mirror. So um, I'm glad that I, I did remove that first. There's the spider and secondary mirror. Um, I kind of wish I had taken measurements of, you know, how many turns on each nut or something like that when I took that apart. But, you know, you kind of eyeball some of this stuff and it's not uh, super critical. There's the hold down for the uh, the primary mirror, kind of a side view. I went ahead and marked each one, uh, Roman numerals one through three. Um, and it didn't really matter, I don't think, but uh, you know, you kind of want to have everything go back to the way it was. Um, but uh, interestingly enough, the screw that's below that, I did not mark or, or count how many turns I had on those knobs and, and you know which one was set where. So. I kind of took track of some of the things I didn't need to and took track of the uh, skips and things I should have. And then there's the focuser again, out of the everything. I tore it down and you can see it's a little more cleaned up. Um, my general rule of thumb was if it was metal, use uh, rubbing alcohol, if it was glass or rubber use uh, distilled water. Now, while I was looking at that focuser, one of the things, uh, and it's a shame that Roger dropped off, but one of the things that I had a challenge with my telescope is that I have to have the focuser pretty far in for it to come into, into uh, focus for the camera. It's great for you know eyepieces, but if I wanna focus on the camera, I have to rack it pretty far in. So I thought, well, I could reduce how much that uh, tube is blocking things. So I came up with a mod while I was in there to actually cut off a notch on that that was actually just sitting there along for the ride. There's some rollers that hit the bottom part of it, but nothing hits the top. So I thought I would notch this out. And you can see the, uh, the actual cuts are complete. And you can kind of see a little bit of a grease line at the bottom where the rollers roll. So um, I said, you know, this ought, to, this ought to help things out. So the idea was, yes, I can't completely eliminate how much the tube goes in there, otherwise I don't have much roll on the focus, but I can reduce the amount of light that it blocks. I did go ahead and uh, use a high-tech magic marker to reduce the glare on that guy. And then, uh, then I started cleaning the mirror. So the first thing I did was a, a, a rinse, a couple of rinses with distilled water, just, just pouring water against it over the sink, trying not to drop the mirror, um, and, which I was successful in. I, did, I think I did have one close call where it, it plopped onto my lap, but uh, I was, uh, my guardian angel was busy that day. So um, after the, the rinse, I did this, uh, I found a couple of YouTube videos on how to clean a, a mirror. Uh, obviously, it's a first surface mirror, so very, very, very uh, delicate. Um, they suggested doing where you take the cotton ball, you, you wet your surface down, you take a cotton ball and rub it against it. But as you go, you kind of roll the cotton ball, not in the natural direction that the surface would go, but roll against it kind of backwards. And the idea is that if you pick up dirt, you're not rubbing the dirt against the surface as you go. Um, that seemed to work pretty good for me. So I put everything together. I thought I was pretty good. And then I remembered as I picked the telescope up that I hadn't clamped down that hold down all the way. I could feel the mirror flopping in the breeze. So I had to take that part back out and then reclamp it down. Then did I cleaned you, up the uh, mount. Uh, go ahead. Uh, when you put the mirror back in, did you move the mirror back up any further up the tube towards the secondary? You know, I I uh, 
thought about that. I, I, I went I, as far as I thought I could safely go. I might redo that again. Um, but it, you only get like an eighth of an inch uh, of play beyond, you know, where it starts to begin. So I didn't have, you know, I didn't want to have it where a bump or something made something come undone. And then, uh, you know, even though I locked everything down pretty good, I was afraid that it, you'd, be, you'd be on the edge where, you know, only two threads are holding your, your expensive mirror into place. So, um, but I might, I might revisit that. That's a good point as far as, you know, because you get two times the benefit there. Well, no, I'm yeah. sorry. You only get one time. I was going to say you get two times, but I think you only get one time the benefit of, of moving it closer. So, um, so I cleaned up the, the telescope mount. Um, I did grease the gears while, or uh, oil the gears while I was in there. Um, luckily there was a gear cover. So the gears themselves never really saw any mud at all. Um, and then actually, I didn't do that great of a job on here. I was kind of in a rush to get it to get something visible. Uh, you can see a helmet in the in the background. You did not have to use a helmet to clear this mount up at all. So uh, here's my first attempt at getting some pictures after the the redo. I was going to say first light, but it's really second light because light had gone through this thing before, and they're not really that great. But I knew that I needed to do some uh, collimation. So uh, just the fact that I got anything at all made me feel pretty good. I think I was trying to get uh, a minor planted in here, but uh, anyway. So I, through the help of Mr. Newbert's uh, collimating tool, I was able to uh, check it out and sure enough, it was pretty far off the, off the mark. So uh, that, that made me feel good about why those images weren't fantastic. And then after culminating, I uh, did get a little bit better picture. So I was much happier with the, with the result there. So lessons learned. I actually, the very first lesson I didn't even put on there, uh, but I should. It said, should say mud plus telescope equals bad. And so that's your equation for today. Um, uh, Lens cap often, but obviously not too often. We all have, have uh, taken exposures with the lens cap on. Uh, remember where your scope is. So when you're driving around in the dark, try to remember where your telescope is. Uh, remember where it's soggy. Um, I, I knew darn well the, the different areas of, of where it was soggy and where it wasn't. Uh, don't clean a mirror unless it really needs it. That's one of the things I saw repeated several times on some discussion groups. Um, they said, you'd be surprised how bad a mirror could look to you and still be just fine. And I think it just comes down to percentages. Oh, yes, there's dust particles. Oh, it looks bad. But really, what's a dust particle doing? You know, we're talking about very, very small amounts over a very far distance and things like that. Um, so my method was, if it's glass or rubber, use distilled water. If it's metal, use rubbing alcohol. Um, I'm sure other folks have, you know, done different things, and there's there's better uh, materials to use. But just for uh, quick and uh, readily available things, uh, that's what I use, and I was pretty happy with the result. Um, another lesson that I think I kind of had from the get to go is if you must tear down, be organized. Um, I think I still could have been a little better, um, especially in the next one. Think all the steps through. I think if I really thought about what I was going to be doing, I probably would have marked where things were on the on the lockdowns and things like that. But uh, I'm not too shook up over that. While I was in there, I could have painted my tube. Um, when I cleaned it up, it kind of, uh, I think, incre increased the glare on the inside of the tube. But uh, and the last lesson is that stuff happens. It's it's only equipment. No no astronomers were harmed in the in the process of me driving around in the mud. So uh, it's always uh, good to get a good perspective on on what things are important, what things aren't. And uh, if the whole thing had been trashed, um, I would have uh, survived the day and, and uh, not been crushed. It, uh, they're just little toys. They're expensive toys, but they're just toys. And that is my story. Any questions? Um, hey, uh, Jack. 
have a question about what you did with your focuser. Um, I'm not quite sure I understand what you, why you did the cutout. Yeah. So, so during normal operation of my telescope, let me see if I can show it. I'll go past the mod. Yeah, for, for me to get my camera into focus, that much of the tube is, of the focuser tube is sticking into the main path of light. And certainly that tube. last, in the, yeah, in the optical path, right. So there's a shadow <clears throat> being cast that large, you know, that yeah. diameter. Yeah, that, I mean, that and makes so sense to me. My hope was to reduce that. I couldn't eliminate it without, you know, Oh, now I get up. it. Okay. So, okay. I was thinking of it the other way around. I thought, yeah, now I get it. Yep. So after I was done, so you can see, actually it's even less than half of the tube is, is uh, blocking the light. Now you have to look at it kind of sideways. The, yeah. the light is coming, you know, from the, from the top to the bottom. So I was thinking the light was coming from left to right, but now I get it. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, I would have done a pretty poor job if I'd done it further left or right. <laughs> Jack, do you have a picture? It's got your your focuser uh, from back where the eyepiece is, like looking down towards the tube. From the from like the if you were to put an eyepiece in, where an eyepiece goes. Yes. Can, 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 you, can you show me that picture for just a second? It's, this has something to do with something totally different. It has nothing to do with you cleaning your scope. Yeah, I don't think I ever had an eyepiece picture. Oh, wait, let me go back to the all done thing. But I think this is, so here's with the camera on it. Okay. Is that what you're talking about, Kenneth? Yeah, but I wanted to see it without without the camera, but that's okay, it's okay. Yeah, uh, do I have that picture? Maybe. I thought you might have had one way back at the beginning showing the, 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 the mud on the scope. Oh, oh, yeah, maybe, maybe. Uh, no, I think that the camera was on. Well, maybe. Let's see. Let's see. We use the high tech. Move the cursor to the arrow to left. Arrow left. <laughs> yeah, well, that, that was, was almost it. Over. Oh, okay. Yeah, that. Even though I'm pulling the focuser out, you can kind of see. Hang on, if it comes back. Yeah, I thought I had. Yeah, is that what you? Yeah, I just want to look at that picture for just a second. Yeah, you can see there's. <laughs> you're talking about for Roger. Yeah. So you can see there's a gear. There's threaded here. So if you can get as your camera as close as you can to that, I think it helps you in in terms of back focus. There was a thread on cloudy nights today where somebody was having that same problem that he's having. And uh, the guy was also trying to use a DSLR. And the problem with DSLRs, mm -hmm. obviously, as we all talked about, was that the sensor is so deep in the camera, it's so far away. But it's a case where scope stuff, yeah. Scope stuff sells a two inch to one and a quarter that actually gets recessed down into the tube itself. And it worked with an eyepiece really, really well. It wouldn't, and I was looking at the, your picture here. It wouldn't, it it wouldn't work with the DSLR, but there are some barrel-shaped um, digital cameras, and it, it would work with a barrel-shaped digital camera. You know, and that's one thing I didn't talk to Roger about. Um, you know, like the QXY or, or what have you. Um, basically, eyepiece cameras. Mm -hmm. th those are really good because you don't have to worry about all that now that's another you know investment that you'd have to have to get but oops yeah 
I think it really comes down to I need a smaller focuser, and I, it's not really that great of a focuser anyway. So um, I was uh, almost hoping that that thing would bind up from the mud, but unfortunately, it worked. And then I wonder if you put a Barlow in there, you know, are you going to get any oh, yeah. getting with it anyway? Well, that's a good point. So, yeah, you get the benefit of the Barlow is basically kind of like a coma corrector to some extent. So, you know, you you do get that that a little bit of a bang for your buck there, and it definitely gives you some back focus. I've got a 2X that I, I definitely work that way fine, and it's, it's not an issue. Jack, you mentioned uh, wanting to paint your tube, but I mean, it looks like your tube's already black. What, what were you gonna do? What were you thinking there? I think he was thinking flocking. Well, in this picture, this is, this is the pre-clean black. And so after I cleaned it, it actually uh, got a little more gray than black. Oh, so, okay. Got it. I thought you meant the I inside. Would have thought, the I thought about, yeah, on the inside, yeah. So, Jack, for, for what it's worth, I uh, I cleaned my primary mirror on a uh, reflector not long ago. Um, it, it had been 40 years sitting around and mostly covered, but, you know, it was a little bit dirty, and I, I just decided I had to do it. So, um, and I did the same technique that you did, you know, saw the same videos and used a whole bunch of cotton balls, and um, yeah, it, it's it's not that hard. It, it was a little nerve wracking at first, but I guess the other thing that worked for me well was um, I just put the whole primary mirror down in a in a laundry laundry sink, you know, on a towel, and just ran tap water over it for a while and to push a lot of dirt out of the right. way. Right. Yeah. So so if the last thing it hits, it hits it is distilled water, who cares that it's Oh, these terrible chlorinated water pouring across it for half an hour. That's that's genius, actually. Yep. Yeah. So you you do the distilled water rinse at the very end, but all the stuff for the cotton balls is was necessary too to get them. And I, I'm sure it was necessary with uh, your mud splatters, you know, because my, my mirror wasn't that bad looking really. I was questioning whether it was even worth the trouble, but um, yeah, in yeah. hindsight, I'm glad I did it. So the funny thing is, I had looked at the mirror like just a few days, maybe a week or two before that and thinking I needed to clean it. And um, well, first of all, I hadn't gone to any of those sites to say, really, you don't need to clean it. But um, I, I had looked and I'd seen like an idiot, I'd left the, the lens cap off too long. I guess I was thinking let's, let's acclimate to the outside air and some bugs had landed on there or something like that. Or who knows, maybe a bird flew by in the dark or a bat whatever, there's a couple teeny tiny dots. And I thought, oh, I need to clean those. And, and in retrospect, I probably didn't need to clean those, um, but you know, they got cleaned along with everything else, so. Yeah. Oh, that was interesting. Yeah, can you, just, can you just go back to your first slide? I just wanted to see, because after seeing what you did, just seeing how it started, that was amazing. Jeez. Yeah, uh, actually, I should have made like before and after side by side. This one, I actually do have a side by side of this of the camera. That one and that one someplace I'll, I, I could uh, post to the group. Um, that To me, that was the amazing. First of all, it's a great testament to Nikon's ability to make things a little bit, you know, rough and tumble. Um, this is not a cheap camera. And I think they they built a little bit of this, you know, hey, the people that are using this camera are probably nature photographers or something like that. Let's make this thing a little bit tough. But that uh, mud didn't, I'm going to say, and that mud came flying out, you know, that just didn't come out gently, you know, with a paintbrush. Right. Oh yeah, it was it was a, a pretty solid impact. There's your. There, oops, went too far. Mistakes were made. It's kind of interesting that, it's, you know, it's like a little uh, lesson in trajectory. You can see <laughs> where the splatter, you know, it really nailed the mount, and it really nailed the bottom of the telescope, and it really nailed the camera. And it really nailed the focuser. 
but you'd kind of expect a little other places, but it's, you know, it's, it's going to land where it's going to land, I guess. <laughs> It's nice to see that my little red path light didn't get much uh, mud on it. Yeah, it was it was pretty safe. I paid a dollar oh, ninety nine uh, for that. And uh, one one item item I didn't mention that uh, Bill's well aware of was that I some of this mud I put into a baggie and uh, sent over to his house because I was afraid I had to pay for his property tax. <laughs> You know, Jack, you said something after you did this that yeah, it really resonated with me is you were glad that you did it, not somebody else, uh, or, or vice versa. There was a, a Oh, that is absolutely inch. true. Yeah, Bill Bierman's 28 inch was not far past you, and that would have been ugly. Yeah, yeah. If I <laughs> if I had done that to somebody else's telescope, or if somebody had done it to my telescope, I would feel bad for them feeling bad, you know. But the good news is I had, I had imaged just prior to this and got a good, good, clean picture. So, you know, <laughs> we all have goals, right? So, yeah, in general, I, uh, in regards to putting mud on your telescope, I would advise against it. <laughs> Jack is uh, imaging intra-telescope dust. <laughs> that's right you guys are going ex extra stellar that's you know <laughs> yeah I'm, I'm so glad that the the cameras was you know had that that tube to deflect the mud so that it didn't get uh you know and the, and the shutter wasn't open and all that stuff can you imagine on the the splatter into the back of the on the sensor oh so, so jack you know there are some people that that would just be so terrified of trying to fix this. They would just take the camera and just sell it to somebody for 20 bucks, you know, and walk, just run away. So I, I applaud you, you for uh, your perseverance there and pulling it together. <laughs> well, thank you. Yeah, I, I honestly, you know, uh, luckily I'd, I'd like to say I have a decent perspective on this. Like I say, it's just little gadgets and things. Um, they're not cheap gadgets, but um, this I, I think kind of encouraged a good perspective in terms of, well, nobody was hurt and you know that kind of thing. Um, but also, uh, you know that that kind of made it. Well, I'm going from zero. What what could I do to mess it up? You know, <laughs> and uh, having worked on uh, electronics and things like that before, uh, I knew to be methodical with the screws and things like that. Um, it's probably not a perfect alignment. I probably need to uh, recollimate it again, and and probably need to, you know, tweak this on that. And um, I'm, I might still buy a focuser one of these days soon. But um, it was a good uh, good exercise to uh, to now I I don't feel so tense about it. Something was a little out of whack inside there to tear into it and take a look. And by the way, in, in uh, kind of to en enhance or uh, incur or reinforce the idea of mis mistakes were made, I made this PowerPoint at work because I was just too lazy to get all my PowerPoint li license up to speed on my laptop. And, uh, you know, I emailed myself some pictures and put it all together. And I said, okay, now I can send it, you know, in a, in a format back to my laptop so that I can present it to everybody. And then it says, this PowerPoint is too large to email. And I was like, oh, okay. So I had to, had to sign on from work and <laughs> get onto the, to the uh, Zoom. And that's why you, you see my uh, still picture and not my beautiful video face, uh, which is, I'm probably doing you a favor anyway. Well, thanks for listening, guys. Um, that's pretty much all I got. That was interesting. That was interesting. I can only imagine that was a long trip home. <laughs> oh yeah, right away I was thinking about the teardown. <laughs> yeah, I wonder how bad it is. Yeah, about the only thing I can relate to that is I, I 
the first time I went down to New Mexico to set up my equipment, the night before I was going to leave, I decided I was going to clean my camera. And I started spinning it off and it dropped six feet to the ground. Mm. And uh, it was a long trip home. I was lucky that it really, it, the only thing it messed up with it was it had an AM, um, a moonlight connector to connect it to my scope and that got uh, bashed in. And that was a, a part that you could buy from moonlight. So I was lucky, but after, after that happened, I wasn't, I wasn't happy. And then I took it back to the, my room there and I couldn't get the filter wheel to work. So I was thinking it was broken and it was a long two day journey home. Oh, I bet so. Well, anybody else have anything they want to talk about? I'd like to ask a question, though I don't know if anybody will know. I have a reason that I would like to take uh, some white light pictures of the moon using a beta filter. And I would be the very first to admit that I've done it before and I've never really liked what I've gotten. It doesn't seem like there's any detail there on sunspots and stuff like that. But anytime I've ever tried, I've tried to do it with single images with the DSLR. And it always looks like it's, I'll say, not quite in focus. And I'm wondering if instead of doing single images, if I shoot video and then stack, am I going to get better maybe results? I've done both um, in the distant past. Um, I. I can't really tell you whether I was getting better with the video or not. It seemed like it had more to do with um, if there were enough sunspots on it, it was easier to get focused. Okay. And at that point, it seemed like the single exposure might have been as good as the video I did. But I wasn't I wasn't putting a lot of effort into it and with it was with an old DSLR. But it was, I, I wasn't getting any, it, nothing, it, there were no sunspots. It was, you weren't getting anything. I mean, when I try it, I, I get sunspots sun sometimes. Spots. Go ahead. I was just gonna say, it's, it's, it's much easier to focus with sunspots. Might try different um, shutter speed too. I'm, I'm always surprised how much, um, you know, something you know shutter flap factors into something like that yeah i'm going with the notion of it a lot of times i use like a 400 millimeter lens tele lens and so i'm trying to go with the 500 to the second shutter speed yeah, and then, think... of course we have the weather like we had today <laughs> I heard that uh, solar maximum might be coming a little bit faster than they thought it might. I just I just saw the headline. I didn't really read. Oh. Yeah, I need to get on the club. I, I I'd really like to try to do the hydrogen alpha stuff, but. I don't know. They the the lunt's been broken for a long time now. I don't know what's wrong with it. I don't think it's moved. Because I was thinking about buying a new CMOS camera, and then along with that, I would probably buy some kind of guiding camera that would be good for uh, solar stuff. Starcap has, I believe, a solar tracking feature. Yes, Steve, did you cut out or? Nope, I stopped talking. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, that kind of rings a bell.
Anybody else have anything? It's going on, I guess, nine o'clock. Well, I appreciate appreciate everyone showing up tonight. Um, I'd love to get copies of the uh, the PowerPoints or whatever, so I could add them to the newsletter and post them on the group. Um, I did record this. I noticed Roger uh, had to drop off, but it might be worthwhile. I'll send him a link because uh, so he can see the what you did to your focus focuser and some of the things that he might try. Um, anything else? Yep. Thanks, Dan and speakers. See you later. Yep. Okay. Thanks, guys. Good one.